Union Public Service Commission. The staggering selection rate and fluctuating vac vac vacancies have made the UPSC examination process a story of struggle and heartbreak that gets eclipsed by the success of the few who make it. The struggle of those who do not make it does not end there. Having focused all their energies on the hopes of getting selected after appearing in an exhaustive examination process, most aspirants find themselves at a crossroads. While the rigor of the preparation makes them well-rounded, well-read, critical thinkers, the flip side is that the magnitude of confusion is bigger. The aspirants desire to bring impactful change to the government and eventually society, but they don't see a clear-cut path to follow. The question here is, is civil service the only way to bring about social change? Is the path inside the system as rosy as it seems from the outside? And what lies beyond, beyond UPSC? During this panel discussion today, we intend to seek answers to these questions and more. To, to take this discussion forward, <clears throat> we have with us three panelists who have diverse experiences and expertise, but are tied by a common thread, UPSC. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. N.C. Saxena, former secretary of the Planning Commission of India. A topper of 1964 batch, Dr. Saxena has served as secretary for the Ministry of Rural Development. He was the director of the National Academy of Administration in Masuri, which trains civil servants. He has been an unorthodox and maverick administrator to say the least. He has authored a very interesting book titled, What Ails the IAS and Why It Fails to Deliver? An Insider's View. In his book, he has shared how he maneuvered his way while working in top policy positions in the government. The book is peppered with anecdotes from his career as an IS officer and also offers suggestions for policy changes. Dr. Saxena is also a prominent faculty member at the Indian School of Public Policy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Saxena. We also have with Thank us Dr. We also have with us Dr. Costa Bondre. He's an MBBS doctor from the Government Medical College and Hospital Nagpur. A deep interest in Indian government's quality and development drove him towards preparation of civil services examination. As an educator and entrepreneur, he has trained and mentored more than a thousand civil services aspirants across the country. Dr. Kostov has a decade long diverse experience working in government, non-government and private sectors. Dr. Kostov is also an alumnus of Indian School of Public Policy. He's completed his postgraduate program in policy design and management from ISPP in 2021. With his YouTube channel and app, he attempts to democratize knowledge. Thank you so much for joining Dr. Kostov. Uh, we were having some te technical difficulties, I think. Uh, we'll yeah. add that out. Yeah, so sorry, sorry, apologies for that. Yeah. No problem, no problem. I'm glad that you're here. It also gives me immense pleasure to welcome Sargam Sharma, the founder of Shores Beyond UPSC, which is a community of former UPSC aspirants that tries to make the transition process easier by providing career, community, and psychological support. She's unafraid of having conversations about what lies beyond UPSC. Sargam has always been passionate about education and the development of human capabilities. This is why she was drawn to do an MA in education from Azim Print University. And five years later, she is a student again at the Indian School of Business during her, uh, doing her MBA. Thank you all the panelists for joining us today. And I would also like to thank all our audience for sending in those questions. Some of the questions will be taken up during the discussion today. Uh, and we'll open the floor for questions in the last 15 minutes of the panel discussion. But uh, please feel free to uh, send your questions in the chat box or the Q&A section. We'll try to take as many questions as we can. I would like to hand over the floor to Sargam and invite her to take this discussion forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nidhi. Thank you, Dr. Saxena. Thank you, Dr. Bondre, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone else uh, listening in. Um, Professor Saxena, I will start with a question for you first. We've received some questions in advance. And this one says that there have been demands for creating separate services for education, as well as health on the lines of the IAS. Do you think that the solution to India's problems lies in creating multiple services or lateral entrance in terms of subject experts? Would that solve the problem? In fact, uh, uh, health and education are not doing very well. 
not only these those sectors where there are no find that progress in the field is very poor it may be recording of uh, land records it may be uh, school education or health nutrition all these programs we do quite well sectors road building power supply etc now the, uh, it doesn't mean that it does not follow that creating all the service for education and health will improve matters because we need to analyze why we are not doing so well uh, here uh, is it uh, the fault of those individuals who are in charge of this or there are systemic failures in my book i analyze i said that look there is nothing wrong with individuals but the system doesn't work very well there are no evaluations there is no uh, correct reporting there is no uh, monitoring of programs our entire administration is input based it is not outcome based so therefore unless we solve those problems just creating a service or in a service for health or for uh, uh, education will not solve the problem it will only mean uh, you know some more uh, uh, parasites who, uh, some more people who would be unproductive and they will not be able to achieve results right thank you uh, dr saxena um going forward from what you just said uh, do you think it's a problem that the service overall is input based and that sort of contributes to creating a bigger aura around it so it's a problem in terms of the impression also one has because they don't uh, see them having the kinds of pressures you see corporate uh, bosses having or them getting fired or demoted so you just have this steady rise you cannot go below a certain level once you're in the services you may rise higher or you may not rise as much so do you think that uh, this would change changing it to a more service, service ias or ips or uh, foreign service etc are very attractive as you know about 10 lakh people appear every year uh, through epsc and just about uh, you know if you include all the Central services also like income tax or railways. Hardly about a thousand, eight hundred to thousand are selected. So therefore, there is a great deal of charm, as says, because of security of tenure, good salaries, good status, power, and that power emanates from the fact that there are two, and those controls give a great deal of power. both to bureaucracy and to politicians and that makes these services very attractive and people like to be in positions of power uh, in order to exercise those controls uh, so therefore uh, just because the service is very attractive it doesn't follow that uh, and it uh, certainly attracts the best but their uh, progress and their uh, out, out outcomes are still very poor and we need to really focus on those issues as to how we can improve the outcomes thank you um uh, drawing further from that i would say would that be correct that when people think uh, that they want to enter the service to make an impact that expectation will not necessarily translate into reality because like you said the outcomes are poor perhaps there are many better ways of creating an impact if that is what solely one desires to do with their life and and the charm of power is perhaps what's more alluring in this case yeah i know to join the all india services they start with a great deal of idealism and they are quite keen to deliver and want to do some want to do good work and many of them when they are in the field they are able to make some changes i'm not saying that their out, uh, output is uh, uh, zero or it is negligible they are but it doesn't last because the system uh, the systemic changes uh, we need to uh, evaluate programs we need to reduce the gap between the our uh, evaluated figures and the reported figures look at you know recent uh, statement by um, uh, our um, uh, government of india ministers when there was talk about hunger she said 
that 33 lakh children are malnourished, according to state government figures. Now, 33 lakh children in the age group 0 to 5 means only 2% of children. Whereas the National Family Health Survey data shows that almost 35% children are malnourished. So therefore, there's a very big gap between the uh, evaluated data and the reported data. And that means that, uh, that accountability is not established. Government of India may be worried that 35% children are uh, malnourished, but the collector or the CDPO or the Aganwadi worker, they said, look, in my Aganwadi, only one out of 100 children are malnourished. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that unless we look at these systemic issues and solve them, initial enthusiasm in the IAS of younger officers, uh, after some time it dissipates. It, it, they feel look, nothing can be changed. And therefore, let's, well, let's follow whatever politicians are asking us to do. And politicians are interested in short term uh, uh, sort of benefits. They are not interested. They don't have the vision to see beyond two or three years. So therefore, those systemic changes can be introduced either if there is pressure on the system from outside. And that's why those who are not able to join the civil service, they can, through consulting organizations, through uh, academic organizations, through uh, being uh, good uh, uh, writers in, uh, through journalism, they can point out uh, these uh, flaws in our administration, and that is what will put pressure uh, on the MLAs, and then questions can be asked, uh, articles can be written. And that is what is needed, I think. So therefore, uh, I have myself, you know, I spent a great deal of my time outside the IAS, I think out of 40 years of my career, uh, about almost 18, 19 years was spent outside that active administration in order to point out in order to study why we are not doing so well and what can be done to improve the system. And one needs to come up with constructive suggestions. Uh, so therefore, I do feel that there is a great deal of scope for those who are uh, not able to join the IAS and but they can still maintain their interest in development through by working in consulting organizations, as teachers, as journalists, and point out why Bangladesh is ahead of us? Why even Nepal is ahead of us on gender issues and sanitation, on hunger, on all those issues you find. International reports show that even Nepal is ahead of us. So therefore, it's a, very, it's a sad situation that India, despite having uh, very competent individual IS officers, they are not able to convert individual competence into group outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saxena. Uh, for the next couple of questions, I will move to Dr. Bondre. I think uh, there are questions we have about careers in public policy and courses in public policy that uh, you would be well placed to answer. Mm, so somebody has asked us, once an ex-UPSC aspirant has decided to pursue an alternate career path by joining a public policy program, have they already fallen behind in the competition in this field too? Because they've lost out on a few years of preparation. So this is what they want to know. Let's start with this. Yeah. Uh, so this question, I if you look at this question that you're fallen behind the career, uh, behind others in the competition, here we are assuming that careers move in a linear fashion. So I would say that now, the kind of disruption we are seeing in economy and the opportunities available, the availability of rich courses, people shifting from one domain to other domain or changing sectors. So here, uh, competition and experience, both are relative terms. So I would say that, for example, uh, limiting myself to the question. So if there's a person who is ex UPC aspirant and then jumps into public policy, uh, the question is that whether they fall behind in public policy too. Now, this depends on their past experience, one, and this also depends upon what their passion is. So if they have particular skills, if they have particular uh, domain specific experience in the past and they do public policy and get back to that sector, so they'll not fall behind. But yes, after a long stint preparing for UPSC, if you start from scratch where you are changing your domain, you're changing your background, changing the area that you work in and you are entering a new domain, relatively for some time, you will be like a fresher. 
so it does it doesn't matter where you come from you started in this field and if so it will take time but uh, i i i would strongly say that if you've done uh, upsc preparation in the past uh, it depends on your skills uh, you can catch up faster right thank you dr bondre i agree with you as well because i feel like one thing upsc aspirants develop is this capacity to persevere and learn tons and tons of things in a short span of time or or a few days and so that is something they should all capitalize on and not be afraid of switching fields because as you said careers these days are very non linear the second question is somewhat related to the first one and i think especially since dr saxena also mentioned that there are so many ways to stay connected to policy and to the development space and uh, pointing out all of these things for which uh, perhaps one might want specialized skill sets so the question goes like uh, what is your opinion on a upsc aspirant taking a pause from their attempts and upskilling by doing a program in public policy and then returning does that make them a better policy maker if they succeed i think they mean if they succeed in clearing the exam later yeah so uh, i think uh, i as i understand it they're asking both that whether it helps the examination as well as later in governance when they do get successful then uh, working as an officer in the field so i would say that uh, when we speak about upsc and public policy the relationship i mean upsc aspirants right they have study and public policy uh, there is a bidirectional relationship so if you are if you have uh, if you are an ex upsc aspirant then it is easier for you to catch up with public policy learn public policy because many of the contacts the schemes and lot of data uh, you already have uh, basic knowledge uh, and and the scope of knowledge is wider uh, having said that the relationship gets even stronger if you go the other way around so if you do public policy and you get back to preparation of upsc then uh, i would say that the ability to see the big picture uh, the skill set that you will have dealing with data and the kind of perspective you would have after having studied say economics public policy politics of uh, public policy even uh, political economy behavioral economics and game theory and all this uh, components of public policy which will help you understand the incentive structure as uh, professor saxena rightfully pointed out that it's the system so when you understand the system the incentives of all the players how things work how uh, how, how uh, externalities affect so i think this is something that they can apply to their preparation as well as when they get back into the field so uh, it's it's definitely a, a positive impact thank you next question someone wants help deciding whether to go for an mba or an mpp especially with the prevalent notion that an mba will prove to be more financially rewarding and a better return on investment i would like to start the answer by saying that um, i would say it's not just a prevalent notion without statistics uh, statistical basis that is one of the reasons i chose an mba over an mpp an isb mba will give you better roi than a harvard mpp in general unless somebody ends up doing something but the reason you do an mpp is not for the financial roi and not for keeping your doors wide open so what an mba does for you is that it gives you the optionality of going into any field you want uh, and a public policy degree will not do that so it's a good idea to do that only when you're 100% certain that that's what you want to do and then all of your classmates will also be in uh, relevant fields and you will have a very policy relevant network i will hand over the question the rest of the question to dr bondre and perhaps if dr saxena wants to add something to it so uh, sir i completely agree uh, to what you said that uh, uh, if they are very sure about they want to get into public policy because the basic difference if you see uh, in an mba and mpb program uh, you know mba the question i mean it has been there for long we know uh, people know much about mba and in the return of investment definitely it's as you said statistics right the numbers speak for themselves but when we speak about mpp if you know what your passion is the focus is on public policy and when we speak about public policy these are the decisions which are taken predominantly by government or related entities which affect larger public interest so if you are a kind of person who is passionate who has the drive to change things something you see wrong and you see that no i i i have to change this right i have to contribute to change this so this kind of drive if you have and you know that uh, you're not just looking for as you said return on investment then i think uh, mpp is a very good option but uh, if you're just driven by that roi and then you're not very sure where you were which sector you would land up later 
then uh, perhaps MPP is a better option. So uh, I think uh, Saxena sir can also. Uh... No, I, I I agree with you that these are two different uh, uh, you know fields. If you do MBA, then your future would be in private sector, which is profit driven, which is uh, in manufacturing or in services, and therefore you are in a narrow field and you're providing management services. Uh, and uh, fortunately in India, uh, private sector has done quite well and uh, uh, it is uh, considered to be quite efficient also. But uh, MPP is to deal with government policy and government policies and government structures need a great deal of reform. And fortunately, the kind of reforms which are needed have not been uh, clearly articulated. You know, when systems, when governments fail, when we do, do not do so well in education or in health or in hunger, or nutrition, sanitation, etc., immediately we start criticizing the IAS. We start criticizing government. Okay, I, but there's a difference. Individually, they are competent. But why does the system work? System doesn't work because unless you change, unless you realize that at this at the top things have to be uh, you know uh, uh, they have to be emphasized take for instance the whole issue of bogus reporting you know if you go down to a village uh, and go to a to a development office say be a blog office you will find that most data that they keep are bogus they are fake they are uh, not correct at all they would show 100 percent houses have been then have got sanitation. You go to the field, you find 40% houses are either do not have toilets or not using that. So there's a very big difference. Now this difference can be uh, reduced only when the chief secretary or the chief minister, they decide that we will not permit a uh, bogus reporting. We will ensure that uh, the gap between reported and the evaluated data is minimized. We will recall you know, in two, October 2021, we declared India is sanitation and you know, open defecation free. 100% houses have got uh, toilets. And But National Family Health Service said in Bihar, only 40% houses have got toilets are using them. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is there has to be that will that we will not allow, uh, you know, bogus supporting to be, to be uh, submitted from the field. So therefore, it requires a change uh, in both in the attitudes of both senior politicians and senior officers. Lower down officers cannot do uh, much on their own. In fact, I was just now looking at the chat and someone has suggested, why don't we emphasize on training? Now, training again has very limited uh, scope for improvement because training is based on the concept that you require individual knowledge and individual skills. And through training, you can only provide individual knowledge, individual skills. Unless you change the pattern of training, you say, okay, we are going to look at sanitation. We'll invite the chief secretary, the sanitation secretary, the collector, and the video, everyone in the same training program. And then point out to them that, look, this is what you have been doing. Name and shame them. Unless you do that, it doesn't hurt. Individual training doesn't help. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that in government, unfortunately, the kind of pressure which is needed from academics, from consulting organizations, from journalists, from opposition MPs, opposition parties, on these issues is just not there. Because these issues have not been studied and we have not analyzed why we are not doing so well as compared to Bangladesh or Nepal or other uh, uh, Thailand, etc. So that is how it is. Thank you, Dr. Saxena. I think you very rightly pointed out uh, individual stopgap solutions to systemic problems cannot be the answer. Um, there will. Do you have something to add? Let me let me just add one one example here. You know, I was talking about uh, malnutrition. Now, what happens in India is that the Aganwadi's worker is supposed to be in her office and record the weights. 
Now, no, no weighing is actually done, and all the entries in the, in the Aganwadi register are fake and inflated. Now, what happens in Thailand? In Thailand, what they do is once a month, they invite the entire village meets. In front of everyone, children are weighed. And then you can find out, you can, that will mean that weighing would be done uh, correctly. It will be known to the parents. Parents can also be you know, put to shame that you are you're, you're not feeding the child. Your child is still uh, malnourished. So therefore, and you can also compare then village, uh, one village with the other villages. That is how they were able to reduce their malnutrition from something like 45% to 10% by, by doing wing in an open house and then educating everyone. Now, what I'm trying to say is that we have to learn from the experience of other countries. Bangladesh does better because Bangladesh has got large NGOs. By BRAC, you'll be surprised to know it employs 80,000 the entire state of Bihar has only 2,50,000 2, government servants. One NGO employs 80,000 workers. 80% 80 of them are women. They work on lower salaries, but they are accountable to, for results. That accountability we have not been able to establish in our government. Very true, Dr. Saxena. And I wonder if, uh, sure, sure, please, Dr. Bondre. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, uh, what? Dr. Saxena was saying, I just add, I want to add one thing. I have a question, sir. So are we saying that uh, after a post-independence, uh, in that duration, government was the main development agency. And now after say 1980s or 2000, development through government, this agenda of youth that I want to get into the services and then I would do something for society, uh, social good. So rather than that, as you said, we need people in and around the ecosystem, say, for example, impact evaluation. So where objective analysis of the schemes and the pressure would come. So talent now, uh, if they want to work in society for social impact, talent has to get into multiple fields around governance and not just in the government. Is that what we are uh, saying here? Yes, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there, there, there could be various ways by which you can put pressure on the implementing organizations. Now, Planning Commission and Niti Aayog is supposed to do, do that. I recall I when I was in the Planning Commission, we evaluated the food uh, uh, public distribution system. And our report said that 54% food grain we desired people. It is, was being uh, given to either wrong people or being sold in the open market. Now, this can be done not only by planning commission or Niti IO, it can also be done by evaluation function in the state government. Unfortunately, you know, these uh, directorates are either do not have the right kind of personnel or the focus on direct uh, reporting is just not there. So unless uh, the it is highlighted in the media. It is uh, raised in the parliament and assemblies. It is, uh, it is also, uh, you know, written, uh, people write about these issues. Uh, these issues will remain as they are. They, no one would uh, take them seriously. Uh, that is what is needed. There are too many controls in our system. Uh, if you, you know, for instance, look at, look at uh, rickshaw pullers. I can buy 1,000 cars and put them on the roads. But I cannot fly a rickshaw without taking a license. So a vehicle which is non-polluting require a license. A vehicle which is polluting, you don't require a license. We, I, uh, I, we, were, we drafted the Street Vendor Act, but it has not been implemented. You can't do street vending unless you bribe the municipal officials. Yeah. You cannot convert land uh, for from agriculture to industry, yeah. unless you take permission. All the everyone knows industry. One unit, one hectare of land will give employment to one family. One hectare of land, if you put industry, you can give hundreds of uh, hundreds of jobs. IIC Indian International Center is based, is in just four two a, less than two hectares of land. And so therefore, when you change land use from agriculture to non-agriculture. 
you give, create more employment, but it requires yeah. permission. So what I'm trying to say is all these issues need to be highlighted. And that highlighting can be done if, if in the public policy force, the chain manpower, and that manpower would be either as journalists or as teachers or as consulting organizations can, can work, or even within government within government, but provided government has the will and the desire to highlight correct information. Dr. Bondra, do you want to add anything to that? No, uh, I, I completely agree to sir, what sir said, and that, that is the point that uh, when we speak about governance, public policy course can help create this cadre in various streams where these people can then uh, bring data, hard evidence, uh, do advocacy, uh, get the pressure groups at the right place and put pressure where it actually matters. So, so in democracy, that is the job of public policy professional to let the power know that juta kaha karta hai, then the needed changes may come. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, apt quotation that you shared with us. There are a few questions uh, on our Q&A panel. I'll take a few of them. Not all of them are very relevant. Um, I think uh, I'll go back to Saxena, sir. Somebody is asking about the motivational issue, saying that you mentioned that uh, generally IAS officers, after a point of time, start believing that nothing can be changed. So what can be done to avoid such tendencies? Do you have any personal experiences? In fact, I would, I would not say that nothing can be changed. If you have, if you put the right kind of pressure and uh, if you... Uh, uh, even in government, you can always come up with good policies. And I have seen that politicians are not averse to good policies. They, they think, you know, uh, I was food secretary in UP and uh, my minister uh, and I had very good relations. The chief secretary was very surprised. He said, look, Naresh, how do you have good relations with your uh, minister? I said, we have a very good distribution of work. I look after policy, he looks after establishment. You know, actually it is other, it should be other way around. Generally on paper, it is civil servant who looks after establishment and the, civil, the minister looks after policy. But because ministers and politicians don't take any interest in policy making issues, I said, I will make the policies. And he was very happy. He was busy transferring inspectors from here and there is some who would make money. But that is another is to change policy. We can always do that. I recall I had once visited a village in Urissa where I found women had been prosecuted for keeping brooms in their house. Because at that point of time in Urissa, the rule in the forest uh, act, the rule was that you can collect hill brooms from the forest, but you can't store them in your house, you can't sell them in the market, and you can't uh, do processing. Now, it is very silly. I, you know, but I, I said, I must make, I must change this policy. Ultimately, when the chief minister came to our uh, planning commission for funds, I said, sir, I will give you 50 crores more if you change this policy. Uh, he agreed. He was himself a tribal. He could see the logic. So there are always scope to make the correct kind of policies, but it will help if pressure is also from outside. And that pressure needs to be uh, built by uh, public policy uh, scholars who would study these issues, find out why India is not doing so well, and then through their various uh, professions, either in teaching or in journalism or in consulting organization, or even within government, they would be able to uh, uh, do this. So therefore, there is, I, there, is no need, there is no scope for any pessimism on this. There is still great deal of scope. And that is why such courses are very relevant. Thank you, Dr. Saxena. Somebody um, also wants to know, this is Ashutosh. He wants to know, can one have the job profile of an IS officer? at the entry level without being an IS officer? If yes, how do I get into that? 
the job profile uh, well in fact the job profile is very different uh, in in government because it also varies from state to state but uh, he would be an is officer would be mostly busy in uh, meeting politicians in meeting people and looking at their day to day grievances etc so the uh, real uh, you know he doesn't have time to go and find out if teachers are present teachers are teaching or not if the health uh, functionaries are uh, um, doing their jobs often what happens is that if he tries to uh, improve system politicians who have been bribed by the health uh, the thing or teachers they would uh, you know get that off the transfer that's another issue one of the reasons why we are not doing so well is that the tenure of an officer at the field level is very short it is often just about 6 to 6 months to a year in fact when i was uh, in the unicef we did a study and found out that in the hindi speaking states tenure of field officers is very very short and that is one reason why you are not uh, accountability is not established and people said look i am here just for a year or so or maybe less than a year why should i look at these issues which require uh, you know a great deal of time to improve so what i'm trying to say is that uh, all these issues need to be studied and then we need to uh, do improvement but the the job of an outsider would be very different from the job of the insider insider is busy doing things outsider is going to study and criticize and be critical and find out why things are not improving thank you thank you dr saxena the next question i'll take for uh, dr bondre there is someone who has commented uh, on your response right now dr saxena we'll come back to that if you would like to uh, dr bondre somebody wants to know how do you differentiate an mpp with an mpa i'm not sure if this question is that relevant uh, here in india mm, a foreign university seem to have uh, two three versions of the same degree in public policy some are more uh, numerical and others more theoretical is what i understand i'm not sure which one is which if you would like to add to that uh, dr bondre please and i will also club that with the next question which is about scope of political consultancy as a career for upsc aspirants okay so uh, first speaking about uh, mpp and mpa so masters in public administration this is uh, i mean see when we speak about masters in public administration the jobs that are available they are not directly they may be academic jobs right but they do not give you direct opportunity to get into the field as public policy would do so public policy the uh, biggest point would be that public policy allows you to have a broad spectrum and then according to your interest and your skill set you can choose say for example if we speak about the public policy cycle right so you can start from identifying a problem defining a problem which we call as agenda setting so uske baad ab policy formulation ka stage aata hai then uh, there are a lot of elements into that too then the actual process of decision making where you influence the decision also so advocacy uh, comes in there then the implementation part of the policy where you uh, generate data and all and lastly it is the evaluation of it and then with next you decide whether to continue the policy or not so this cycle though we have a model like this this is Uh, this is applicable to most agendas most most uh, sectors in the field so this uh, diversity in the job profile can be generated and people can choose along this entire spectrum where they want to focus where their interest lies and where their skill set matches as opposed to it if you speak about just masters in public administration uh, at present in the indian context actual jobs for such profile are largely academic whereas the practical application part of it still is not clearly defined yet so if you really want to work with the government as a part of government or implementing schemes public policy seems to be presently a better option as compared to mpa which has been there for long but never became too attractive as a career option Uh, I think there was one more question about uh, scope of political political consultancy, right? Uh, as that. a career, we can take a couple of the other questions if you would rather skip that. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, um, so we have a question which I find is very relevant to this discussion. Two questions that I'll take back to back. Defence forces in India have progressively allowed multiple entry points 
Is it not time for administrative and diplomatic services to do the same? And Dr. Saxena, Dr. Bondre, both of you, are your thoughts on this? In fact, you know, this is a very uh, relevant point. If you look at the structure of bureaucracy in India and also uh, emoluments, etc., you find that as compared to other countries, the number of government servants that we have is very little. We have only just about 1% of our population in government service, whereas uh, world average is three, and the Nordic countries and Scandinavian countries have 6% six per, uh, six people in government service. Then we find that there are a large number of people in staff positions who are not needed. Uh, babus and, and uh, orderlies and drivers and cooks. And there is shortage of teachers, nurses, uh, policemen, judges, people who can deliver are absent, people who are, who are in staff positions are too, too many. And salaries are very high. Now, unfortunately, our revenues are very small uh, because people don't pay taxes. Black money, 50% of our economy is a black money. So therefore, with the limited revenues and with very high salaries, what do the what do what does what is the solution? Therefore, you know, government has come up with this uh, Agni Viri scheme, where you have uh, work on a lower salary, but only for four years. I have when I was in the planning commission, and I, I in fact, this is written in my uh, one of my papers. I said, look. Uh, in the long term, you need to do, improve your revenues. But in the short term, what we can do is, for all class three government jobs, you start uh, appointing them as con in, on a contractual basis. So therefore, supposing uh, you stop regular recruitment, so don't recruit any clerk, don't recruit any uh, policeman, don't recruit any teacher. You say, we will only recruit on a contract basis, for the first five or eight to eight years, and gradually keep on increasing the salary, 20,000 this year, 23,000, 25,000, and then it goes to 40,000. So therefore there is, so therefore there is certain continuity. You work on a lower salary, and after some time you get absorbed in the system. Now the, this present scheme, which is of four years and only 25% would be retained, that is very demoralizing. I am not in favor of this. I think you should have a system whereby you stop recruiting on a regular basis. You only take people on contract and keep on increasing the salary regularly after 10 years. And that will certainly will mean that government the pension burden will be uh, uh, reduced, your salary burden will be reduced, but your manpower will increase. Are in staff positions like clerks or uh, orderlies and drivers who are not needed, persuade them to become teachers, persuade them to become policemen. And uh, you know, we, do, we don't require drivers now. People should drive their own cars or they should hire uh, from the market um, uh, taxis. So, therefore, the, the structure of government service requires a great deal of improvement. And unless we studied holistically, you know, this kind of a uh, solution, that is not a good solution. I agree with you there, uh, Dr. Saxena. Um, the next question is from somebody who's aspiring for the IFS. They're saying they feel like the UPSC exam is more inclined to services like the IAS instead. So should IFS be separate, considering the heavy weight of Indian foreign policy to be played in the geopolitical scene? In fact, you know, uh, it depends on the number of vacancies. Now, IFS has limited number of vacancies. IS has more, that IS equipment may be 150 to 200. IFS may be only 25 or 30 or 40. So if you're recruiting only 25 and 30, there is no need for a separate examination. You can't increase the number. So therefore, if you are if your number is limited, why for 25 people have a separate examination? Let it be part of common examination. And in fact, earlier in the 50s and 60s, 
foreign service was the desired option for the toppers and everyone. I, up to my batch, I found that, you know, in the, out of the first 30, 20 would opt for the foreign service. But things have changed. Now everyone wants to opt for the IS and uh, foreign service is not the first option. But uh, since the number is limited, I'm not in favor of a separate examination for the foreign service. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, the cost of conducting such an examination would far outweigh the limited number of seats that we have. On that note, uh, do you believe we also need to increase the number of seats? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bondri, this question is for you. I am interested in policy making. Should I pursue civil services or pursue public policy? No. Many people who come for, for preparation of civil services, they have this fancy notion that you get into the services and you are a policy maker, right? So that, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Saxena would agree that uh, initially you do make policies at your own level, but that is true even for corporate world. So point is you are implementation arm for a long period of time where you give feedback for shaping policies more effectively. So in this case, if you are interested in policy making, so even if you go for civil services or even if you go for public policy course, in the initial stages, when you are learning in the field, uh, you're not directly making policies. You're part of giving inputs through your work, through your uh, skills for making or changing policies for better. So uh, I, I, would, I would say that uh, though the subject area you are highlighting that you want to get into policy making is common, there are other important considerations that when you get into government, uh, there are very different set of restrictions that operate. And uh, you're kind of a generalist who is supposed to deal with many subjects. Whereas if you go into po policy making initially, that can, uh, or public policy, here you will have a choice to focus on your passion, uh, your area of interest, and develop uh, the skill set which is more commensurate with that and rise in that particular sector where you can give very important inputs for policy making. So uh, that, that would be my answer for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bondri. I am done taking the questions uh, from the one that, ones that we had. If there's any other question over here that you would like to take, then we can take that question as well. Uh, if there are any more questions, or if somebody wants to speak, they can please raise their hands and I can uh, give them the um, sure. permission to yeah, speak. Yeah. Before we have that, uh, I wanted to uh, learn from Dr. Saxena. I was just uh, telling him at the beginning of the session as to how the services have become even more glamorized in some ways with the advent of social media and officers becoming mini celebrities on Instagram, Facebook, etc. So, uh, Dr. Saxena, so what would you like to tell the people uh, listening in who perhaps uh, might have been influenced by this uh, glamorized version of the IAS or the IPS that they see on social media because they uh, uh, officers post images of them going in schools, say they've gone for an Anganwadi visit, or they're visiting ASHA workers, and they will make it look like there's a lot of impact, although that's a part of their day-to-day -day job. They may might have an inspection, and you're not actually going and doing uh, a lot of work in that school every single day of the year. But the perception that perhaps viewers get is that, wow, this is so much impact. You are doing such big heavyweight things every single day. So what do you have to say to those people? Well, in fact, IS is certainly glamorized because of the status and because of the fact, as I said, that 10 lakh appear and only 1,000 are selected. But um, uh, this the present system requires a great deal of reform. And one of the reforms I would suggest, you know, in, in our days, when we appeared in the IS, we were allowed only two, two chances, only two years. If you, if you don't succeed in those two years, you are out. Now, today you can appear for 10 years at, uh, in continuum. Now, what happens is for 10 years, you waste your life and then you are not selected. So therefore, you know, uh, if you reduce the number of, ch of uh, chances to just two or three, or at the most four, for say OBCs and civil class civil tribes. Then what will happen is other options will be uh, uh, you know, more apparent and more attractive and we will realize that look uh, you can do much better by not being in the IS. So therefore these if you, if you keep on 
uh, with the kind of uh, status and glamour associated, people keep on appearing. I, I, feel, I feel very sad. It is only giving uh, employment to coaching centers <laughs> and coaching centers are fl flourishing. But uh, the young generation is losing 10 years of their life. Which is uh, which is very unfortunate. I agree with you on that, Dr. Saxena. It's unnecessarily glamorized uh, to the point that so many. I think it's a demographic waste of our demographic dividend that so many of us are drawn to the yes. exam because of an unrealistic picture. Uh, Dr. Bondre, I would like you to answer this question before we wrap up the session um, and have more questions. The scope and opportunities for public policy in India are still in the growing phase. So should we consider doing masters in public policy from India or from abroad? And on that note, I had a question uh, before the session as well, uh, very related to this one. I'll read that one out as well. What is the scope of work one can engage in after doing a, a masters in public policy from India and abroad? How is the public policy space abroad different from the public policy seen in India, especially in terms of the kinds of jobs that are available? Okay. So... Uh... When we speak about public policy in India and abroad, and how, I mean, if you have to differentiate, uh, my understanding is that uh, there was a time when, uh, and now also, if you see, if you have done public policy outside, uh, that adds a lot of weight to your CV when you're back. But one thing has distinctly changed. Uh, the India till 1990s and 2000 was completely different, where the awareness was limited and uh, majority of force was within the government only. After 2000, we have seen that uh, with economic development, rise of awareness, uh, technology, internet, social media, what has happened is the role of private sector has become very important. Entrepreneurship is coming up. So there's a lot of pressure and demand on government to fulfill its objective. Now, in this context, the demand for policy consultants or policy professionals is not only from center, that is Delhi, right to the level of Gram Panchayat or Tessel or even urban local bodies, there is huge demand for uh, specialized personnel who would help implement policies uh, in more efficiently. So I would say that the knowledge of uh, uh, mythis, as it is called, the, the location, the context. So this importance of Indian context in policy making is something that is very, very good and a positive development that you can't just have a fancy degree, float it around and then become a consultant, get a lot of money and bring best practices without figuring in the local context. So that I believe is a real democratization where uh, policy uh, course is more relevant if it includes a context to local content. So uh, in that sense, I think uh, the quality of public policy courses that is available in the country uh, it's, it's really good and this is better if you are uh, aiming to work in the country. So this is uh, my take on the comparison. Uh, I think, uh, uh, does that, uh, that does answer the question or uh, there was a point uh, that was remaining? Uh, I suppose we'll need the asker of the question to tell us that, you know, whether what they wanted to know has been answered. Uh, there are a few more new questions. Do we want to take another question or should we wrap up? It's 8 p.m. Yes, I think uh, we are like at the end of the uh, discussion here. But, uh, you know, I would love to have more questions from the attendees. Uh, they can email us. They can email me uh, or uh, contact ispp.org.in. I will try to, you know, uh, uh, get some answers from our panelists today. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, um, I think we should wrap up now. Okay. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks once again, Dr. Saxena and Dr. Bondre, you. for your valuable perspectives. I hope that uh, after doctor, listening to Dr. Saxena, many of the ex-aspirants who are still very attracted to the exam would reconsider more seriously what the real motivations are and whether their expectations would be matched by reality once they are in the services. Yes. And um, just to you know, wrap up the discussion, I would like to thank everybody for this discussion. I would like to in, uh, thank all the panelists to join us today and having this you know, very important discussion. Um, while there are many career, uh, you know, career uh, avenues open to UPSC aspirants, uh, public policy plays an integral role in forming laws that bring tangible social progress around the world. This is something that we have discussed. Um, and I think public policy education might be you know, one of the missing links here. 
and uh, we can uh, you know we can always have a discussion later and i would love to bring uh, panelists back uh, to you know this discussion sometime later and thank you everybody for joining us and uh, you can write into us and you can write into me you can give a call i have uh, put in all the details in the chat box and uh, thank you so much dr saxena for joining us thank you so much uh, for giving us so much time thank you so much costo uh, dr costo for joining us and uh, always helping out uh, uh, wherever we you know we have these discussions and thank you so much uh, thank you so much sargam for you know uh, joining this discussion uh, when we started talking this was something that in this was just a seed of uh, thought that we had and it has really grown into this beautiful discussion today so i'm really glad that uh, all of us we could come together and have the discussion thank you, uh, thank you everybody Thank you for calling me. Let's keep up the collaboration. I'm sure we can have many other interesting collaborations as well in the future. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. All the best. Take care and good night, everyone. Good night.